So I want to welcome everyone on behalf of Weave a Real Peace or WARP as we finally call ourselves uh, to this continuing textiles traditions workshop. And the topic today is tours and travel. Um, I'm going to share this screen a little bit, I think. Let's see if it'll let me. Uh, this is a page of our website that has a description of the, of the talk we're going to have today. We're going to start with Marilyn Murphy, who is the board president of Andean Textile Arts and is also the founder of Cloth Roads. So I think we'll hear about both of those from her today. Then we're going to hear from Sheila Desai, who's going to talk about EYHO tours, and I'll leave it to her to tell you what EYHO stands for. And the third speaker will be Wendy Garrity of Textile Trails, and she's coming to us through the wonders of video. So Wendy's not actually going to be with us today, partly because the time zone is so different. She's on the other side of the world from where Kelsey and I are located. <laughs> um, but she wanted to tell her story, so we'll hear from her third. Okay, um, I think the first speaker is going to be Marilyn Murphy. So if you haven't muted yourself, please do. We're happy to see your smiling face, but if you do something like decide to have a bowl of popcorn, you might want to, you know, put your yourself on freeze too, so that we're not salivating as we listen to this talk. Okay. So Marilyn, will you take it? Oh, I'm going to stop sharing and Marilyn can take it away. I will. Thank you, Judy, so much. Uh, so when we were doing a bit of rehearsal, Judy said, well, how did you get into doing all of this? And I was like, oh, I guess I better give you a bit of my circuitous route into the world of global textiles and how you know cloth roads and then my um, activities with Andean textile arts came into being. So um, I will be reading from some notes. So you know, excuse me on that, but uh, otherwise I'd just get down that rabbit hole and just talk to you about textiles the whole time. So I'm going to start my share screen here. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I grew up in the multicultural city of Chicago. So that even when I was young, I had attended ethnic fairs and markets around the city where people would wear their traditional garb, play traditional music, dance, and of course, sample various cuisines. My friends were small United Nations. And in college, I pursued my interest in clothing and textiles as well as art which then led me to working at a local weaving shop, which I eventually bought. And that was the weaving workshop in Chicago. In the mid eighties, I expanded the shop as well as formed the nonprofit, the Textile Arts Center in Chicago. And at that time, it was an incredibly rich fiber hub. But then I also had, there was an allure to pursuing another textile path. So in 1994, I moved to Colorado to work in publishing at Interweave Media with my primary focus on developing tours and events based on what else, the things that we love that we make by hand. So being a maker myself, you know, weaver, spinner, dyer, many other things, it seemed to be a really great learning experience for me to expand the Interweave brand and at the same time, bring people together in person at events and on tours. So over the years, as um, Interweave grew, as did my role there, and eventually um, I was president of the company. In the 90s, as electronic publishing and social media took hold, I realized how much I missed working in the artisan sector and knew it was time to retire from publishing. So with that change in 2011, myself and three other colleagues launched Cloth Roads. And our mission was to provide opportunities to support indigenous textile artisans worldwide. 
over the years, that took on many forms. But most of all, we marketed and sold one of a kind and limited edition locally resourced products made mostly by women artisans. Our partner, Linda Ligon, started a sister company called Thrums Books, which was dedicated to preserving the narrative of traditional textiles and their makers. This book, the first, was one of the first published by Thrums Books, the traditional weavers of Guatemala, by Deborah Chandler and Teresa Cordon. So during that process, we thought, why not share these incredible cultures and artisans through small group travel? And since I had experience in both um, planning and guiding tours, it made sense to partner with these book authors as both in-country experts as well as guides. Hence, we really embodied cloth roads. I'm gonna show you some um, images and the artisans and uh, people that we met in um, Guatemala. Whenever we did a cloth roads journey, they were based on um, artisans that were featured in the books because we had you know, the best experts in these areas, both the artisans and the authors. So in this case, you know, we, we visited basket makers, basket weavers. Uh, we went to markets as well as going into some of the villages where we were able to see the actual um, weaving and weaving preparation being done. We were able to, you know, va vast amount of travel and always taking in the local um, markets. And as we learned, as many of you I'm sure know that when you carry your spinning or your knitting or any of your portable tools and fibers with you, that that's all you need to have with you because the anybody who you meet, they're always entranced by how we do things. And of course, we're also taken with how they do things. Our final visit with the artisan in Guatemala was Amalia Gue. And Amalia um, and the cooperative that she works with, Ixpalam K do this amazing white on white brocade weaving. And this village is about seven to eight hours drive from Antigua. So overnight, Amalia and her sister, Carmen, and Amalia's young son at that time, Faye Francis, joined us in our hotel and they um, demonstrated weaving and I had known Amalia for a number of years through the folk art market. In fact, uh, Faye Francis was born uh, while Amalia was here in the States at the folk art market, so hence the name Faye Francis. So then we went on um, you know, many years later, another book and another journey, and we were off to Morocco. This time, uh, featuring um, the women artisans, um, Susan Schaefer Davis, amazing work with um, these women through many years. And this was our last journey that we did um, pre-COVID. This was in, we had a number of journeys with Susan in both 2018 and 2019. 2019 was the last one. I went on this one in um, 2018. For those of you who may not know where Morocco is, you can see it's at this very, very tip of Africa. And you know, Susan always put together just lovely, you know, we stayed in lovely riads, we uh, went to the mosques, we got to see the last working draw loom in Fez with um, the draw boy on the right pulling the thread. So we had a glimpse at these incredible textiles. 
And then we went and started into the villages, um, visiting the women's cooperative of Cherry Buttons with Amina um, Yabas. Um, we got to do a hands-on making of the buttons, of which I think we all actually learned to make a basic one. And the terrain changes from one side of the mountains to the other. So similar to where I live in Colorado, not so much desert, but still uh, lots of changes. Our very last village that we visited was way up in the um, anti-Atlas Mountains and it's the village of Nako. And these women weavers are incredible. And when we arrived that day and the bus pulled up, um, which we had to break into a couple smaller buses so that we could make uh, the journey there, that they had all their rugs spread out and we were happy to see them and they were happy to see us. And as you can see, not many rugs were left behind um, from that day. So now I'm gonna move on to another sort of fork in the road that was actually happening at the same time for me, um, because during the years of publishing at Interweave, I had met Nilda Kayanapa, um, a Quechua Peruvian woman who had founded the Center for Traditional Textiles of Cusco in the late 1990s. So over the course of a few years, um, after I, you know, quote unquote, retired from publishing, I joined the US nonprofit board, Andean Textile Arts, and our mission is to support the people of the Andes and their efforts to preserve and revitalize their textile traditions. For more than 15 years, ATA has sponsored tours to Peru. These tours benefit the Center for Traditional Textiles of Cusco, bringing textile enthusiasts to its center in Cusco, as well as the various weaving villages in the highlands. So you can see where the highlands, um, of the, what is known as the Cusco highlands and the villages that are highlighted on this map are the 10 weaving um, um, communities that uh, the Center for Traditional Textile um, works with. So our adventure of our tours always, um, we, we begin in um, Cusco at the, at the center and uh, that we do guided tours of key historical and archeological sites, both in Cusco and the Sacred Valley. We visit many villages. We have a full day dye workshop in Chinchero. We go to the local markets. We spend more time at Machu Picchu hiking. And at the end, we have a private tour of the collection at the Amano Museum in Lima. Unique to our tours is the participation of Nilda who accompanies us to these highland villages. She organizes workshops and provides personal connections between the travelers and the artisan weavers. Nilda's explanations of each village's designs and traditions add deep context to our adventures and the experience for both the weavers and of course, being able to um, purchase the weavings up, cl up close and personal. In addition to the close connection of ATA with NILDA and CTTC, our tour options have included participating in the worldwide um, Tinkui gatherings in Cusco, which in, there were three in 2010, 13, and 17. We had planned to start working on another one um, pre-COVID, so that is um, on hold for a while. And we've also, um, these gatherings have included uh, many uh, special dye days. We've had uh, one tour actually was able to be there at the time that there was um, a connection to the other communities. All 10 of them have came together for a day of sharing, um, which always includes dancing and soccer or football. And as part of those tours, um, 
we were actually also able to expand um, into Bolivia in 2019. So as with Peru, our tours focus on artisan textiles and their makers. We'd spend time in both large cities and small village markets. And the tours are always focused on helping to understand and sustain the inherent textile traditions of people and place. As a nonprofit, ATA passes the proceeds of our tours along to help the people we are visiting. And we always have very sensitive and expert in-country guides that um, we employ as part of the tours. We are in the process of further refining our Bolivia tour and making more connections with the artists and groups when COVID put a halt on all of our tours. This past year though, through the generosity of donors, ATA has funded transportation to bring the weavers to get their vaccines. We've assisted in their purchasing of natural dyes and fibers. We've purchased phone cards so the young weavers could continue um, school remotely. And we've continued to grant funds towards revitalizing the um, traditional techniques of tapestry, paracas looping, and the Nazca Watai and Tikia weaving. We've also recently launched an online program for fiber guilds, which will take you up close and personal to these villages, to meeting the weavers and learning about their amazing textiles. We now offer online education programs about the Andean Highland communities, and we all long for the time that we can once again celebrate with the weavers in their villages. We hope that someday you can travel with us. We certainly long for the time that we can all be on the cloth road together again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marilyn. That was terrific. What a wonderful experience to travel along with you for the last few minutes. I look forward to um, hearing more about that. If I think I'm going to hold questions until um, after we've heard from both of our in-person speakers and our virtual presenter. So, but if you have something that's um, very specific that you feel like you need as a follow-up, feel free to type it in the chat and I'll um, ask either Marilyn or Sheila as we go along um, to clarify something they've said. And I think we all know the, the routine with chat these days, so uh, feel free to use it. Thanks again, Marilyn. You're welcome. Okay, so our next speech speaker is going to be uh, Sheila Desai. Sheila, are you with us? Yes, I yep. am. Oh, it. yay, there you are. Okay, um, I will let you handle introductions. I, I told them you would explain what E-Y-H-O stood for as part of your presentation, in case anyone is curious. And how do you pronounce that, the name, when you're talking about the name of your organization? How do you say it? It's it's just E-Y-H-O, as in eat your heart out. It's basically, uh, yeah, it's one of these silly. Anyway, there is a, there's a story behind that. I'll, I'll get into that. <laughs> but yeah, so thank you, Judy. Thank you for the introduction. And sure, uh, we do have one question, someone t that Anna typed in, and I think this would be for both of you. So I'm going to hold it to the end. But she wants to know how one would go about joining an expedition in the future. So we'll we'll, we'll have that as our first question in the Q and A period. If you don't cover it now, okay, all right, go right ahead. Thank you. I'll share my screen now, and and and. And thank you, uh, Marilyn, that was, that made me want to jump right on one of your tours. And I know that when I go to Peru, it'll be with you because uh, it, it all just looks so wonderful. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you very much, WARP uh, members for having me on today. Um, I am going to talk about my little tour company. I call it the little tour company that can or that could, because it didn't start out like that. It was, um, it was very, it was a very organic grassroots kind of start. Um, I, will, uh, I will get into why it's called EY Tours. I will speak briefly about how we started, the kind of travel we offer, 
and and why we connect the uh, the creators from the traditional world to appreciators in the industrialized world. And then I will focus on a very big part of, of the work that I do, which is um, the social imprint of EYHO Cares and giving back to these communities that we visit. So um, this little travel company, as I call it, uh, started very organically. I organized a, a tour uh, for a group of friends. It was, a, it was supposed to be a culinary tour, which is why it, we came up with this idea of eat your heart out. And it wasn't really a tour company at that point. It was just, okay, it's a bunch of friends, let's travel together. There were eight of us initially, and that grew into uh, a 19 person tour. And basically we were in and out of palaces and local homes, tiny homes meeting you know, aristocrats as well as local families. We took trains. We celebrated the Indian festival of Holi, which is the spring festival of color and generally traveled beneath the surface. Uh, this was about 12 years ago. And it was so much more than a point A to point B stay in a five star kind of bubble tour that people tend to go to when they go to India because it's kind of, it's, it's intermediate for some people um, that I had many requests for a repeat. And, um, and so, you know, when I tried to change the name at that point, um, everybody was like, no, we remember it better if you just say EYHO tours and I couldn't change it. But anyway, importantly, after that, a friend who had said, helped to set up the South Asian gallery at the Royal Ontario Museum here in Toronto, approached me to organize a textile tour to Gujarat and Kutch. And at that time, I knew next to nothing about textiles, handmade textiles. I have a, I am a chartered accountant by, by background. And I actually grew up in Kenya, which is where my grandfather emigrated from India. And so I had, you know, the, the connection that I had with Gujarat in India, which is actually one of the richest textile, has one of the richest textile tradi traditions in the world, was just when I was taken back there to, um, for holidays. And I never, we never really ventured outside my, my grandfather's house when we were taken there. And so when my friend, Arthi, took me to Gujarat and she introduced me to, uh, to its very rich handmade textile traditions, it was a revelation. I just could not believe that I had almost overlooked this entire huge slice of my heritage. And I was completely smitten. Well, so from there on, it was, uh, I was on a mission to educate myself. Um, I wanted to showcase India's textile heritage. I also noticed how poorly the, um, the artisans were, were paid by Western standards for work that was truly outstanding. And, uh, and, and crafts and skills were disappearing because the fabric literally of handmade, handmade textiles was full of holes. The infrastructure around a craft was disappearing and slowly many would completely die out. I, I began making all these connections. And so, and, and I could see that many communities were um, already moving. There was a great deal of rural to urban migration. And so I just thought, well, what can I do? So I, I began to use my, um, my travel organizing skills, the one tour that I had, or a couple of tours that I had, uh, to showcase these skills to textile enthusiasts from the West. So in, an, in, in the early days, a, a textile artisan that we visited would ask, would wonder aloud, aloud and they would say, um, all these people coming to see us all the way from America or Canada or XYZ to see us and see us weaving or see us block printing. And I'd say, yes, your skill is very valuable. Teach your sons, teach your daughters and stay with it because there are so many people all over the world who are interested in what you do and they will buy your product. I will bring more people from back there. Don't send your son to, to drive a tuk-tuk, stay with the art, stay with the craft. And I could see that this boosted their morale. And of course my travelers supported them by buying their production, always respectfully and fairly, of course. Um, we always ask our travelers to not bargain with an artisan selling or his or own product and always be respectful. Um, and, and, and the travelers that we've had been wonderful. They've been so supportive and so encouraging. So 
it, it, it was it was a real win win situation for the for the artisans who were creating and for the people who were there coming there to see them. And so um, over the 12 years, this is this is India, this is where we started, where you see the little red star that's Gujarat and Kutch, this area here. Um, it's a very special place for textile traditions because it's it's almost like um, the crossroads and it was also a part of the ancient Silk Road at one point. And so there are many, many textile traditions there, many, many arts and crafts traditions. And so, um, yes, yeah, so that's where we started. And then now we've expanded over to nine states in India and uh, each one has, it's almost like a country in its own right, a country within a country because the textile traditions are so different, so much diversity. Uh, and so we just kept exploring different parts of India. Um, and every time I would either have uh, expert textile guides or uh, scholars accompanying because um, I, I have a full confection. I'm not, I can, um, I can make patterns, I can sew, I can embroider, but I can't weave. Uh, and uh, so I always had uh, you know, like experts accompanying us. So uh, that's where I say we, when I say we, I mean, you know, it was always a collaboration. Um, but I understood that this was something very special that needed to be showcased and, and retained. And now, um, 12 years later, we are, the tours have expanded to all over the world. Um, and, and we'll go into that a little bit more, but we're, we're continuing to expand to Japan, to Indonesia. Uh, there's tours that go to Morocco uh, and, and uh, Turkey and Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, all of that. And so this just kept going on. Um, basically, I lead the tours that go to India and I'm always, I always accompany. And uh, then the, the tours that go to Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Morocco, Southeast Asia, they all have um, uh, you know, experts or scholars in their own rights to lead these tours. And here are some uh, photographs from those areas. Uh, this, this lady here is doing felting. We, we went to Kyrgyzstan uh, just before the pandemic uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a nomadic culture. So they have a lot of, uh, you know, they used to make a lot of these felting to line their yurts and also to just tr transport all their stuff from one pastoral area to another. And, 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 very, and you know, to contrast that to what goes on in Central Asia and uh, in Uzbekistan, is uh, Uzbekistan was a more settled agrarian uh, society and um, uh, mercantile as well, because that's where the silk route came through. And so you see very different, this is a Suzani embroidery, which is very different. Um, and, you know, this is Morocco, there's these cherry buttons. We, we had the, uh, I, I think the same sort of uh, workshop that Marilyn went to. And um, so we, you know, we've been to so many places, uh, wonderful, wonderful people. We always uh, collaborate with people like uh, Chloe Sayer, who is the British Museum curator for places like um, Mexico to to uh, to get into you know far reaches of Mexico where the weavers uh, operate. And in uh, fall of next year, we will go to Chiapas as well, so Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Turkey. So uh, yes, it's it's been quite a journey. Um, so, uh, you know, besides the, besides the tours, which also are going to morph into the next things that I want to bring in on uh, the EYHO platform is uh, scholar-led historic and architectural tours. So we have, we have the weaving, the textile, which is the focus of most of the tours, but then we also have a lot of people who are interested um, by association, I guess, with history and architecture. And this is something that we I've realized over the pandemic when I've been putting on events on the EYHO platform that people are very interested, people who are interested in textiles also are very interested in how these textiles developed. And, and so, the, you know, it's like continual uh, learning process. So that is coming very soon. Um, and um, so I'd, I'd like to now talk about how we give back through EYHO Cares. Well, one thing is for sure, and I think uh, uh, both the speakers today will agree with me that 
one does not get into textile tours because they want to get up to the Fortune 500. There is this is definitely a labor of love. It's 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 done with a lot of passion. It's done, and it's it's all consuming, just like uh, the the weaving or um, you know whatever your passion is. It's it's you have to have this real passion, and so when you go into these villages and you see that they are struggling, they are they need support. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is how can we give back? And so this is a big part of what we do at EY Chotours. Um, and so we have we have ongoing initiatives that we fund through uh, when we take people there into these villages to buy their product and also for funding support. Uh, here you'll see a little map. Here, these are the villages. There's a, a few villages in Gujarat and Kutch, and uh, we support villages in uh, Kaladera and Rajasthan as well, and West Bengal, and then in Assam also. So the way uh, these villages, I, I tend to identify these villages as self-help villages. They're cooperative self-help villages. They, they get some help from the local NGOs, but they really are doing fabulous work by themselves. And I prefer to support them directly because A, uh, we do go back to them every year. I do get to see the difference that our funds, our contributions are making. And I engage, I can engage in conversation with the villagers, the elders, even children to make sure that they're attending school. I'll encourage young girls to learn from their mothers and their grandmothers. They have uh, the village, itself has full discretion on how to use the funds. But over time, we see schools and dispensaries being built. We see small banking facilities. Internet is now quite, uh, you know, it's quite widespread. And uh, there's enrollment and skills development programs run by the, the NGO. So um, because we have, because I have this connection with them every year, I, I go and visit these villages, I can see that this is a more direct way of helping them. Here's some more. There's, this is the Mishing village in Assam. We'll provide them with looms if they if they you know need new looms or if you know every time we go back in Mutwa village, for example, in Kutch, they've been building beautiful homes and and you know you can see that level of prosperity is, is inching up every time that we go. Schools for the girls, um, and and so it's uh, you know it, it, it's all coming back. And um, so the other thing that we have done also is uh, during COVID, obviously the last tour was in January of 2020 and then we were all shuttered. So during COVID, uh, I, because I couldn't visit them, uh, I, I switched to supporting local NGOs and we've managed to raise a, a, a great deal of funds to support these two NGOs. Um, they will. They would. They provided COVID testing, COVID hospitals, obviously things like things like um, supply of oxygen, development of apps, and general generally uh, educating the people about um, safe practices, meals, supplies, and uh, we also did a lot of sales through the EYHO community for certain villages where I would just say. Um, why don't you tell me, post photos of what you are, what you would like to sell or what you have in stock. And I would use social media to gather support around this. And they, they got all, they collated all their, um, uh, the, the, the product. And then they learned how to ship. I would provide support for shipping it. And I have to say that there were there were barely any errors. Everybody got their product all over the world. Some product went to Australia, some went to the UK, all over Europe, Canada, the US, and uh, they learned so quickly. Uh, it was it was quite amazing. Um, the other ongoing initiatives that we have is that I have profit share with local guides. So I realized after after the first six seven years that the guides that I was using, uh, for example, this young man uh, near Bai, is he was so talented and he had so much textile knowledge. And yet just to let him stay as a, as a freelance guide was not doing justice to his skills. And so I offered to profit share with him. So just as instead of just being a freelance guide, he now gets 30% of all the profits. 
and he actually ends up running the tours. So it's 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 all about giving back and empowering the locals to to take over. I also have a very popular annual textile sale here in Toronto, and I will give pre presentations and talks. Um, I will go to places where artisans have become uh, prosperous enough to become middle men or middle people. And I will tell them, I will ask them for to donate their product and I will bring this donation, this donated product back. We will have these textile sales and then the, the money goes back into these communities. So, and I'll give talks and presentations. So that's another way. Um, I also run a Facebook group that has now about almost 5,000 members. And um, it's just to showcase uh, textile traditions and um, not, not a commercial, group at all, but uh, just to keep showcasing these textile traditions. So uh, I, I, I was hoping that I'd be able to bring in my one of my village uh, partners uh, today from India, but it's proving the time difference is proving to be a bit of a challenge. And so um, that I will wrap up my presentation with that and uh, hand it over to you, uh, Judy. Sheila, thank you so much. It's just uh, astounding how from the little seed of your interest uh, and your first tour, you've grown such a vibrant uh, organization. So congratulations. We'll have some questions in a few minutes, but one more presentation today. And I think Kelsey is going to introduce that one. Yes, I'm going to screen share now. Um, this is a video that was made by uh, Wendy Garrity of Textile Trails. And as Judy said, she lives in Australia. So since it's uh, the middle of the night for her, we are um, sharing her wonderful pre-recorded video. So I am, let's see here, I have it here and I will just go ahead and start the video. Thank you, Walt, for inviting me to be part of this event. I'm so happy to be part of Weaver Real Peace and I really value the connections that it has allowed me to make. My name is Wendy Garrity from Textile Trails and I run an annual tour to Bhutan that brings together my passions for traditional textiles and empowering artisans in grassroots economies. Bhutan is in Asia, we'll zoom in a bit over the Himalaya, where Bhutan is a small country between India and China, east of Nepal. Textile Trails has transformed over the last 10 years and developed four arms. Documenting traditional textiles, a retail arm importing fair trade textiles, teaching Bhutanese weaving, and textile tours. I began Textile Trails 10 years ago primarily to share my documentation of traditional textiles and techniques. I've always been fascinated with how traditional textiles are created. And whenever I travel, I'm drawn to the dyers and the weavers and the embroiderers. I also love learning by doing things with my hands, so I'm always asking to be taught. I'm a music teacher by profession. From 2010 to 2013, I took a career break from music education to pursue my interest in women's empowerment, grassroots development, microfinance and traditional textiles. As well as travelling through Asia and South America, I spent time volunteering with Kalaraksha in India, at Ok Pop Tok in Laos, and I taught English in a tiny school in Nepal. I spent a couple of weeks in Bangladesh with the Grameen Bank to learn about their work in microfinance and social business. And I spent a year in Bhutan teaching music. All of these experiences expanded my understanding in so many ways and continue to inform my approach at Textile Trails. My career break also gave me plenty of opportunities to continue learning about and documenting traditional textile techniques. The highlight of these was learning to weave the Bhutanese brocade known as Kishitara 
I spent eight months weaving before and after school during the year that I was teaching music in Bhutan. Before I went to Bhutan, I hadn't been able to find details of how Kishitara is woven, either in books or online. So once I'd learned the basics, I wanted to document and share what I'd learned in case others were looking for the same details. Then I went on to document other Bhutanese techniques. So the Textile Trails website began mainly to record techniques, but I had too much fun and it grew from there. The next part of Textile Trails I developed was the retail arm. When I first returned to Australia, I was hesitant to return to music teaching. So I launched a business importing fair trade handwovens from Laos, Cambodia and Peru, which I sold at local markets. Next I added teaching Bhutanese weaving. I was approached by a woman in my city who wanted me to teach her weaving group what I had learned in Bhutan. Having learned this on a backstrap loom, it was quite a learning curve for me to adapt this to Western looms. But I enjoy problem solving and I love teaching and have now visited the US and Canada three times for teaching tours and recently produced a series of free instructional videos on the basics of Kishitara. All of this fed into Textile Trails tours. While I was living in Bhutan I dreamed of being able to bring others to meet my Bhutanese weaver friends and to experience the culture and the incredible textile traditions of Bhutan. Textiles are absolutely integral to Bhutanese culture. They were formerly used to pay taxes. They're still given as gifts on significant occasions. They're used as a store of wealth and so on. The Bhutanese have unique and impressive weaving traditions. The pinnacle of their handwovens are the Kishitara and the Aikapur, prized for their complex supplementary weft twining and warp patterning and worn for setu, which are festivals, and other special occasions. Both Aikapur and Kishitara are intricate and time-consuming to weave. With a full Kishitara kira taking around nine months to create. Here's a few examples of Kishitara, which is what I learnt to weave when I was teaching music in Bhutan, but not on this scale. As you can see, there's great scope for a variety of designs and creative expression. For the remainder of this presentation, I'd like to outline some of the features of my tours. Firstly, an emphasis on hands-on learning opportunities. I am a process-driven hands-on learner myself, and I find joy in facilitating these opportunities for others who are seeking them. So wherever possible, we get our hands on looms, into dye pots, onto spindles. I also understand the power of raising awareness of what goes into making these beautiful pieces. And as an educator, it's natural for me to incorporate these activities and to see their wider effect. I have seen that people with an awareness of these traditions and appreciation of the skills involved are more prepared to pay a fair price for them. I've also seen that when machine-made imitations undermine the local market, artisans often need to look for a wider market to sustain their traditional work economically and to preserve their intangible heritage. On my tours, we connect directly with artisans as much as possible, often visiting them in their own homes to watch them work. And wherever possible, we make our purchase directly from the maker. We do this on an individual basis rather than working with formal cooperatives. This is Nobu Laden. This is Funso. Tsering. Pumpa. Here Karen and Tinle are discussing Tinle's weaving. My time selling fair trade pieces in local markets taught me that in addition to valuing ethical production and connecting to a piece through understanding how it is made, my customers were even more interested in who made the piece and the stories connected to it. So I create opportunities to establish a personal connection with the maker. And of course, purchasing directly from the maker puts more funds directly into their hands. I find this particularly matters to me because I've seen how much of the tourist spend in Bhutan is funneled through the tour companies and the booking systems. And I'm conscious of trying to spread the tourist dollars more widely 
and more directly into the grassroots communities when I can. This is Jumbe, a master weaver who lives in the city, but who designs and commissions village weavers, keeping tourist funds flowing to many weaving families. This weaver was trying on some reading glasses that one of our tour group had brought as gifts. This is Chimmy, a monk who can weave Kishitara. Chimmy became my friend when I stayed in his village for five days to study Kishitara. When he's not on a meditation retreat, he loves to host us. Small groups. We travel as a small group capped at 10 guests. I live in Australia, but guests join my tours from across the globe. Setu, or festivals. We make a beeline for festivals for many reasons, but especially because, apart from being a great place to mix with the locals, this is when the Bhutanese put on their best goas and kiras, and we can be close to all those gorgeous textiles. And the effect is really quite stunning when the designs are moving around on bodies. The visual effect changes as the wearer moves towards us or away from us. We also usually try to attend at least one setu on the final day when the tondril is displayed. This is a giant tanka that is appliqued and embroidered and hung on the side of a building. Flexibility and serendipity. We're also quite opportunistic about visiting artisans wherever we find them. An unplanned interaction with locals are some of the highlights of our trip. So we try to leave plenty of time for them. Here we had stopped to view a nomad tent and before we knew it, Kathy and this yak herder were spinning together. Local activities. We also take the opportunity to shop with a local shop. Here we were buying back straps for looms. Sometimes we picnic in the local style. We observe everyday local activities and gain insight into the lives of the people and immerse ourselves in the culture. These boys were closing the school gate as we were passing. We also include a village stay, which allows us to slow down and immerse ourselves in whatever is happening in the village at the time. Whether that involves spending more time with the weavers, a bit of archery, which is the national sport, joining in the meal preparation, some impromptu spinning perhaps, plenty of playing with the children. Here's Pat bonding with a weaver. And we always end up dancing together. One of the most unique features of these tours is that I offer to teach Kishitara en route. One guest said it's a little like a travelling workshop. Whenever we have some spare time and energy, we take out the looms that I bring along and I offer instruction to anyone who is interested. I can also weave Aikapur. Here we were stuck waiting for the road to be cleared, so on the bus I demonstrated Aikapur technique to make it more clear when we saw it being woven at speed later. We also have the opportunity to learn from local experts, such as Rinzen and Lecky. And I love that by the end of the tour, guests are identifying different weaves and have enough of an understanding of the techniques to confidently appraise the quality of the work. Although our main focus is on textiles, there are many other active art and craft traditions for us to learn about. And I enjoy finding out the particular interests of each member of our group and arranging activities to suit when I can. And of course, it's not only about textiles and crafts. Visiting Bhutan is often a once in a lifetime treat. And so we take in the major sites and soak up the culture and the landscape. Every tour finishes with the opportunity to climb to Taksang, the Tiger's Nest Monastery, which is the most sacred temple in Bhutan. This brings me to the end of my presentation. 
If anyone has questions, I'd love to hear from you. Not right now though, because it's 2am in Australia and I am sleeping. But there are ways you can get in touch. You can visit my website, textiletrails.com.au. Follow me on Facebook. Follow my channel on YouTube. Sign up to my newsletter via Facebook or my website or use this direct link. And you can also find me on Ravelry. If this kind of adventure sounds like your thing and you'd like to travel with me, you can sign up to be notified when I release the next tour. That sign up form is on the tours page of the Textile Trails website. Thank you for having me. Okay, I feel like I've been around the world today and it's only been an hour since we started. Um, that was a particularly well done video, I think. So Kelsey, thanks for making that happen. Um, and we have time for a couple of questions uh, before we have to adjourn for the day. We are going to have another presentation, though, next month. Let me give a, a brief commercial for that before I leave you. We're going to have a theme of authors at the December meeting. The, and that will be on December 11th. I think that's right, Kelsey, from 1 to 2. And you can sign up now on the on the Warp website in order to be on that list. Is that true? I don't. I think you're muted, hon. We will have the um, the registration ready for the December talk on Monday, and I'll send an announcement out to all of our members and contacts, and that will be on the homepage as well. Perfect. Okay. So questions. Um, I think I'll ask the one that was. I think it was Anna popped in earlier, is how, what, well, let me ask it another way. When do you think you're going to start giving tours again? Marilyn, um, Sheila, do you, do you have a um, projection? This is Marilyn. Um, we're, Andean Textile Arts is undergoing a risk assessment right now um, to determine how soon we can um, start. It's not so much for our travelers, but we need for the weavers and the villages to feel safe for us to um, come into Peru and Bolivia. So as much as we hope that that could be next fall in 2022, we're not, we're not quite sure yet. So that but would you be can the get soonest. on our list. Yeah, 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 that would be the soonest. And um, I posted in the chat, um, if you're interested in the future tours, to email pam.art at icloud.com. Very good. That's great. I love about you. Yeah, so Judy, um, basically the tours are restarting, starting January, and uh, we're, we're, we are going to the, on the India Textile and Stepwells tour. This time there's an architectural component to the textiles that we've been uh, showcasing because there is a close link between how the textiles developed to historically how stepwells, which were um, which were basically, you know, these, these fantastical wells that were dug, underground temples that were dug to get to the water table. So basically what we're keeping an eye on is the, um, is the vaccination rates in the countries that we travel to. So <clears throat> India has been doing very well with their vaccination rates. And if the vaccination rates, particularly in the rural areas, we've been tracking how much, how, how um, the artisans and their families are being vaccinated. And if they are double vaccinated, then we are proceeding with the tours. We are going to make the call um, over the next month, whether the January trips can proceed. It's always a very close call because I don't think people are ready to travel like a year ahead, even um, it's just there's just too many uncertainties. So yeah, so January is, is uh, India and, and then March is um, Uzbekistan and uh, Morocco. So Morocco again has been doing very well with their vaccinations, and as long as as long as the population is uh, doing well, there's there's uh, only 
less than say 500 to 700 per 100,000 people uh, of COVID cases. And everybody on our tours are fully vaccinated. We're taking all the necessary protocol. Uh, so we're, we're, we're going ahead with these tours because you know these communities do need um, the support. They're, they're really hurting. And so we're going to take calculated risk and we're traveling in January, hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, uh, one more uh, question that was written in for Marilyn and Sheila. Uh, Wendy had, had said she has a cap of, I think, 10 people on one of her tours. How big are the tours that, that you've been doing in the past, Marilyn? And what about you, Sheila? Um, for cloth roads, we usually do pretty small group, anywhere from eight to 12 people. Um, I think with the Morocco, we've gone up a little higher than that, 14. Um, Andy and Textile Arts, um, we've gone 20-ish. Um, but again, they're, you know, they're always small, small group. Yeah, so it's, um, it's similar for EYHO as well. It's impossible to put on tours that have anything more than 16 people, 18 people, really. That is the max, and that's very rare. Uh, on average, the tour groups are about 10, 12, and sometimes even less, like eight people, um, because we're going into artisans' homes, and they're, and obviously they're quite small, and so it's, and just to give that feeling of uh, connecting with the artisans and their families, we have to restrict the numbers. And obviously now, more so with COVID, um, just have to make sure that, you know, we're not crowding into places. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, and I think with that, we will call it a day for today because there's a another war um, meeting coming up at 2.30 and I want to give everyone a chance who's interested in tuning into that too to take a little break and and um, reflect on what we've heard think about where you want to take a trip to once it's we all feel safe traveling again and and enjoy the the either 84 degree weather or it looked like we had a minus one degree weather listed in our chat this morning. So it's been, it, it, there's a wide range this time of day. Oh, if you have, um, I just saw a note here. Someone had missed the first part of the Zoom. Yes, they will all be posted on YouTube. It usually takes Kelsey a week or two to, to get them all trimmed up properly. Um, so she will send out a note with uh, contact information again for our speakers and also a link to where you can watch the video again if there are parts you missed. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been good spending a little Bye. bit of our Saturday together. Bye-bye. See you next month. Thank, thank you. you all for being Bye. here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.